Welcome to Citizenship Ready. This is part 2 of Canada's history. In this video you will learn about A growing economy The War of 1812, the fight for Canada Rebellions of 1837-38 Responsible government Confederation Challenge in the West Moving westward The First World War Women get the vote. Between the wars. The Second World War. Coming next. A growing economy. The first companies in Canada were formed during the French and British regimes and competed for the fur trade. The Hudson's Bay Company, with French, British and Aboriginal employees, came to dominate the trade in the northwest from Fort Garry, Winnipeg, and Fort Edmonton to Fort Langley, near Vancouver, and Fort Victoria, trading posts that later became cities. The first financial institutions opened in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. The Montreal Stock Exchange opened in 1832. For centuries Canada's economy was based mainly on farming and on exporting natural resources such as fur, fish and timber, transported by roads, lakes, rivers and canals. Coming next. The War of 1812, the fight for Canada. After the defeat of Napoleon Bonaparte's fleet in the Battle of Trafalgar, 1805, the Royal Navy ruled the waves. The British Empire, which included Canada, fought to resist Bonaparte's bid to dominate Europe. This led to American resentment at British interference with their shipping. Believing it would be easy to conquer Canada, the United States launched an invasion in June 1812. The Americans were mistaken. Canadian volunteers and First Nations, including Shawnee led by Chief Tecumseh, supported British soldiers in Canada's defence. In July, Major General Sir Isaac Brock captured Detroit but was killed while defending against an American attack at Queenston Heights, near Niagara Falls, a battle the Americans lost. In 1813, Lieutenant Colonel Charles de Salaberry and 460 soldiers, mostly French Canadians, turned back 4,000 American invaders at Shadowgate, south of Montreal. In 1813 the Americans burned Government House and the Parliament buildings in York now Toronto. In retaliation in 1814, Major General Robert Ross led an expedition from Nova Scotia that burned down the White House and other public buildings in Washington, D.C. Ross died in battle soon afterwards and was buried in Halifax with full military honors. By 1814, the American attempt to conquer Canada had failed. The British paid for a costly Canadian defense system, including the citadels at Halifax and Quebec City, the naval dry dock at Halifax and Fort Henry at Kingston, today popular historic sites. The present-day Canada-USA border is partly an outcome of the War of 1812, which ensured that Canada would remain independent of the United States. From left to right, HMS Shannon, a Royal Navy frigate, leads the captured USS Chesapeake into Halifax Harbor, 1813. There were also naval battles on the Great Lakes, Major General Sir Isaac Brock and Chief Tecumseh. Together, British troops, First Nations, and Canadian volunteers defeated an American invasion in 1812-14. The Duke of Wellington sent some of his best soldiers to defend Canada in 1814. He then chose Bytown, Ottawa, as the endpoint of the Rideau Canal, part of a network of forts to prevent the USA from invading Canada again. Wellington, who defeated Napoleon in 1815, therefore played a direct role in founding the national capital. In 1813, Laura Secord, pioneer wife and mother of five children, made a dangerous 19-mile journey on foot to warn Lieutenant James Fitzgibbon of a planned American attack. Her bravery contributed to victory at the Battle of Beaver Dams. She is recognized as a heroine to this day. Coming next. 
Rebellions of 1837-1838 In the 1830s, reformers in Upper and Lower Canada believed that progress toward full democracy was too slow. Some believed Canada should adopt American Republican values or even try to join the United States. When armed rebellions occurred in 1837-38 in the area outside Montreal and in Toronto, the rebels did not have enough public support to succeed. They were defeated by British troops and Canadian volunteers. A number of rebels were hanged or exiled, some exiles later returned to Canada. Lord Durham, an English reformer sent to report on the rebellions, recommended that Upper and Lower Canada be merged and given responsible government. This meant that the ministers of the Crown must have the support of a majority of the elected representatives in order to govern. Controversially, Lord Durham also said that the quickest way for the Canadians to achieve progress was to assimilate into English-speaking Protestant culture. This recommendation demonstrated a complete lack of understanding of French Canadians, who sought to uphold the distinct identity of French Canada. Some reformers, including Sir Etienne Pascal Tatch and Sir George Etienne Cartier, later became fathers of Confederation, as did a former member of the Voluntary Government Militia in Upper Canada, Sir John MacDonald. Coming next. Responsible Government. In 1840, Upper and Lower Canada were united as the province of Canada. Reformers such as Sir Louis Hippolyte Lafontaine and Robert Baldwin, in parallel with Joseph Howe in Nova Scotia, worked with British governors toward responsible government. The first British North American colony to attain full responsible government was Nova Scotia in 1847-48. In 1848-49 the Governor of United Canada, Lord Elgin, with encouragement from London, introduced responsible government. This is the system that we have today, if the government loses a confidence vote in the Assembly it must resign. La Fontaine, a champion of democracy and French language rights, became the first leader of a responsible government in the Canadas. Sir Louis Hippolyte La Fontaine, a champion of French language rights, became the first head of a responsible government, similar to a prime minister, in Canada in 1849. Coming next. Confederation. From 1864 to 1867, representatives of Nova Scotia, New Brunswick and the province of Canada, with British support, worked together to establish a new country. These men are known as the Fathers of Confederation. They created two levels of government, federal and provincial. The old province of Canada was split into two new provinces, Ontario and Quebec, which, together with New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, formed the new country called the Dominion of Canada. Each province would elect its own legislature and have control of such areas as education and health. The British Parliament passed the British North America Act in 1867. The Dominion of Canada was officially born on July 1, 1867. Until 1982, July 1 was celebrated as Dominion Day to commemorate the day that Canada became a self-governing dominion. Today it is officially known as Canada Day. The Fathers of Confederation established the Dominion of Canada on July 1, 1867, the birth of the country that we know today. Dominion of Canada $1 Bill, 1923, showing King George V, who assigned Canada's national colors, white and red, in 1921, the colors of our national flag today. Dominion from Sea to Sea Sir Leonard Tilley, an elected official and father of Confederation from New Brunswick, suggested the term Dominion of Canada in 1864. He was inspired by Psalm 72 in the Bible which refers to Dominion from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. This phrase embodied the vision of building a powerful, united, wealthy and free country that spanned a continent. The title was written into the Constitution, 
was used officially for about 100 years, and remains part of our heritage today. Expansion of the Dominion 1867, Ontario, Quebec, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick. 1870, Manitoba, Northwest Territories, NWT. 1871, British Columbia. 1873, Prince Edward Island. 1880, Transfer of the Arctic Islands, to NWT. 1898, Yukon Territory. 1905, Alberta, Saskatchewan. 1949, Newfoundland and Labrador. 1999, Nunavut. Did you know? In the 1920s, some believed that the British West Indies, British territories in the Caribbean Sea, should become part of Canada. This did not occur, though Canada and Commonwealth Caribbean countries and territories enjoy close ties today. Canada's first Prime Minister in 1867. Sir John Alexander Macdonald, a father of Confederation, became Canada's first Prime Minister. Born in Scotland on January 11, 1815, he came to Upper Canada as a child. He was a lawyer in Kingston, Ontario, a gifted politician and a colourful personality. Parliament has recognised January 11 as Sir John A. Macdonald Day. His portrait is on the $10 bill. Sir George Etienne Cartier, was the key architect of Confederation from Quebec. A railway lawyer, Montrealer, close ally of Macdonald and patriotic Canadian, Cartier led Quebec into Confederation and helped negotiate the entry of the Northwest Territories, Manitoba and British Columbia into Canada. Coming next. Challenge in the West. When Canada took over the vast northwest region from the Hudson's Bay Company in 1869, the 12,000 metres of the Red River were not consulted. In response, Louis Riel led an armed uprising and seized Fort Garry, the territorial capital. Canada's future was in jeopardy. How could the Dominion reach from sea to sea if it could not control the interior? Ottawa sent soldiers to retake Fort Garry in 1870. Riel fled to the United States and Canada established a new province, Manitoba. Riel was elected to Parliament but never took his seat. Later, as Medes and Indian rights were again threatened by westward settlement, a second rebellion in 1885 in present-day Saskatchewan led to Riel's trial and execution for high treason a decision that was strongly opposed in Quebec. Riel is seen by many as a hero, a defender of Medes rights and the father of Manitoba. After the first Medes uprising, Prime Minister Macdonald established the Northwest Mounted Police, NWMP, in 1873 to pacify the West and assist in negotiations with the Indians. The NWMP founded Fort Calgary, Fort McLeod and other centers that today are cities and towns. Regina became its headquarters. Today, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, RCMP or the Mounties, are the national police force and one of Canada's best-known symbols. Some of Canada's most colorful heroes, such as Major General Sir Sam Steele, came from the ranks of the Mounties. From left to right. Fort Garry, 1863, the flag of the Hudson's Bay Company flew over Western Canada for 200 years before Confederation. Sir Sam Steele, a great frontier hero, mounted policeman, and soldier of the Queen. Medes resistance, Gabriel Dumont was the Medes' greatest military leader. From left to right. Members of the train crew pose with a westbound Pacific Express at the first crossing of the Illicilwit River near Glacier, B.C., 1886. Chinese workers camp on the CPR, Kamloops, B.C., 1886. Canada's economy grew and became more industrialized during the economic boom of the 1890s and early 1900s. One million British and one million Americans immigrated to Canada at this time. 
Sir Wilfrid Laurier became the first French-Canadian Prime Minister since Confederation and encouraged immigration to the West. His portrait is on the $5 bill. The railway made it possible for immigrants, including 170,000 Ukrainians, 115,000 Poles and tens of thousands from Germany, France, Norway and Sweden to settle in the West before 1914 and develop a thriving agricultural sector. Coming next. The First World War. From top to bottom. Maple leaf cap badge from the First World War. Canada's soldiers began using the maple leaf in the 1850s. The Vimy Memorial in France honors those who served and died in the Battle of Vimy Ridge on April 9, 1917, the first British victory of the First World War. Most Canadians were proud to be part of the British Empire. Over 7,000 volunteered to fight in the South African War 1899-1902, popularly known as the Boer War, and over 260 died. In 1900, Canadians took part in the battles of Partiburg, Horse Mountain, and Lillefontaine, victories that strengthened national pride in Canada. When Germany attacked Belgium and France in 1914 and Britain declared war, Ottawa formed the Canadian Expeditionary Force, later the Canadian Corps. More than 600,000 Canadians served in the war, most of them volunteers, out of a total population of 8 million. On the battlefield, the Canadians proved to be tough, innovative soldiers. Canada shared in the tragedy and triumph of the Western Front. The Canadian Corps captured Vimy Ridge in April 1917, with 10,000 killed or wounded, securing the Canadians' reputation for valour as the shock troops of the British Empire. One Canadian officer said, it was Canada from the Atlantic to the Pacific on parade. In those few minutes I witnessed the birth of a nation. April 9 is celebrated as Vimy Day. Regrettably, from 1914 to 1920, Ottawa interned over 8,000 former Austro-Hungarian subjects, mainly Ukrainian men, as enemy aliens, in 24 labor camps across Canada, even though Britain advised against the policy. In 1918, under the command of General Sir Arthur Currie, Canada's greatest soldier, the Canadian Corps advanced alongside the French and British Empire troops in the last hundred days. These included the victorious Battle of Amiens on August 8, 1918 which the Germans called the Black Day of the German Army, followed by Arras, Canal du Nord, Cambrai and Mons. With Germany and Austria's surrender, the war ended in the armistice on November 11, 1918. In total 60,000 Canadians were killed and 170,000 wounded. The war strengthened both national and imperial pride, particularly in English Canada. From left to right. Sergeant, Fort Gary Horse, Canadian Expeditionary Force, 1916. Sir Arthur Curry, a reserve officer, became Canada's greatest soldier. Coming next. Women get the vote. From left to right. More than 3,000 nurses, nicknamed Bluebirds, served in the Royal Canadian Army Medical Corps, 2,500 of them overseas. Agnes MacPhail, a farmer and teacher, became the first woman MP in 1921. At the time of Confederation, the vote was limited to property-owning adult white males. This was common in most democratic countries at the time. The effort by women to achieve the right to vote is known as the women's suffrage movement. Its founder in Canada was Dr. Emily Stowe, the first Canadian woman to practice medicine in Canada. In 1916, Manitoba became the first province to grant voting rights to women. In 1917, thanks to the leadership of women such as Dr. Stowe and other suffragettes, the federal government of Sir Robert Borden gave women the right to vote in federal elections. First to nurses at the battlefront then to women who were related to men in active wartime service. 
In 1918, most Canadian female citizens aged 21 and over were granted the right to vote in federal elections. In 1921 Agnes MacPhail, a farmer and teacher, became the first woman MP due to the work of Therese Casgrain and others, Quebec granted women the vote in 1940. Coming next. Remembrance Day. From left to right, Canadian soldiers observe Remembrance Day. Remembrance Day Poppy. Canadian War Veteran. Canadians remember the sacrifices of our veterans and brave fallen in all wars up to the present day in which Canadians took part, each year on November 11, Remembrance Day. Canadians were the red poppy and observe a moment of silence at the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month to honor the sacrifices of over a million brave men and women who have served, and the 110,000 who have given their lives. Canadian Medical Officer Lt. Col. John McRae composed the poem in Flanders Fields in 1915, it is often recited on Remembrance Day. In Flanders Fields the poppies blow. Between the crosses, row on row, that mark our place, and in the sky. The larks, still bravely singing, fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago, we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow. Loved, and were loved, and now we lie. In Flanders' fields, take up our quarrel with the foe. To you from failing hands we throw. The torch, be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die. We shall not sleep, though poppies grow. In Flanders fields. Scouts with Remembrance Day wreath. Coming next. Between the wars. Phil Edwards was a Canadian track and field champion. Born in British Guiana, he won bronze medals for Canada in the 1928, 1932, and 1936 Olympics. Then graduated from McGill University Medical School. He served as a captain in the Canadian Army during the Second World War and, as a Montreal doctor, became an expert in tropical diseases. After the First World War, the British Empire evolved into a free association of states known as the British Commonwealth of Nations. Canada remains a leading member of the Commonwealth to this day, together with other successor states of the Empire such as India, Australia, New Zealand, and several African and Caribbean countries. The Roaring Twenties were boom times, with prosperity for businesses and low unemployment. The stock market crash of 1929, however, led to the Great Depression or the Dirty Thirties. Unemployment reached 27% in 1933 and many businesses were wiped out. Farmers in Western Canada were hit hardest by low grain prices and a terrible drought. There was growing demand for the government to create a social safety net with minimum wages. A standard work week and programs such as unemployment insurance. The Bank of Canada, a central bank to manage the money supply and bring stability to the financial system, was created in 1934. Immigration dropped and many refugees were turned away, including Jews trying to flee Nazi Germany in 1939. Coming next. The Second World War. In the Second World War, the Canadians captured Juneau Beach as part of the Allied invasion of Normandy on D-Day, June 6, 1944. The D-Day invasion, June 6, 1944 in order to defeat Nazism and Fascism. The Allies invaded Nazi-occupied Europe. Canadians took part in the liberation of Italy in 1943-44. In the epic invasion of Normandy in northern France on June 6, 1944, known as D-Day, 15,000 Canadian troops stormed and captured Juneau Beach from the German army. A great national achievement shown in this painting by Orville Fisher. Approximately 1 in 10 Allied soldiers on D-Day was Canadian. 
The Canadian Army liberated the Netherlands in 1944-45 and helped force the German surrender of May 8, 1945, bringing to an end six years of war in Europe. The Second World War began in 1939 when Adolf Hitler, the National Socialist, Nazi, dictator of Germany, invaded Poland and conquered much of Europe. Canada joined with its democratic allies in the fight to defeat tyranny by force of arms. More than one million Canadians and Newfoundlanders, Newfoundland was a separate British entity, served in the Second World War, out of a population of 11.5 million. This was a high proportion and of these, 44,000 were killed. The Canadians fought bravely and suffered losses in the unsuccessful defense of Hong Kong, 1941, from attack by Imperial Japan, and in a failed raid on Nazi-controlled Dieppe on the coast of France, 1942. The Royal Canadian Air Force, RCAF, took part in the Battle of Britain and provided a high proportion of Commonwealth aircrew in bombers and fighter planes over Europe. Moreover, Canada contributed more to the Allied air effort than any other Commonwealth country, with over 130,000 Allied air crew trained in Canada under the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan. In the Pacific War, Japan invaded the Aleutian Islands, attacked a lighthouse on Vancouver Island, launched fire balloons over BC and the prairies, and grossly maltreated Canadian prisoners of war captured at Hong Kong. Japan surrendered on August 14, 1945, the end of four years of war in the Pacific. This is the end of the history chapter in Discover Canada. Check our channel to find hundreds of practice questions for citizenship test preparation. Good luck!